Good morning. Let's stand. Let's praise our Lord together. Let's sing out loud and let's make a joyful noise. Let's invite the Lord. Let's ask Him to open up the heavens so we can see Him. Here we go. One, two, three, four. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our praise. What kind of joyful? Let's sing out louder. Two, three, four. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our praise.
open up the heavens, Lord. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice flows like the ocean's tide. I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Yeah. Your justice flows like the ocean's tide. I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. I will find my strength. In the shadow of your wings. Sing that again. I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord. Reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Announcements. We had Sunday school this morning. I don't know how many of you got to be a part of that, but we're excited about trying that out for this summer, for this month. And so I think that might be where Justin is right now, finishing up. But we're glad that you're here today. Don't forget, next Sunday is what? Father's Day, and you need to be here at starting at 9.30, okay, to get all you can eat flapjacks next Sunday for Father's Day. It's going to be free, going to be a great time. We'll have some uh, Chris Cakes here, and he'll be flipping camp pancakes for us along with sausage and some other things so you come hungry and come bring be sure you bring your dad we're looking forward to that time of celebration and sharing together and you can come early and still be a part of the Sunday school class too as uh, they meet over in that room over there uh, with Nicholas and Justin right now turn to somebody find somebody welcome them this morning shake your hand real hard and wake them up okay
I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. I will lift my voice to worship you, my King. I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. Let's continue to worship. to declare the reign of the Lord our God. We, we will not, not be moved when the earth gives way for the reason one has overcome. And for every fear there's an empty grave for the reason one has overcome. Now the silence breaks in the name of Jesus as the heavens cry let the earth creation shouts with the voice of triumph to declare the reign of the Lord our God. We will not be moved when the earth gives way for the reason one has overcome. And for every fear, there's an empty grave. For the reason one has overcome. He shall reign forever strong. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you. 
You're the reason why we're here. You're the reason why we're singing. You are the reason why our hearts are filled with joy. Why we have hope. You are the reason why this day started off so well. And you are the reason why this day will end so well. Because you are with us wherever we go, whatever circumstances we are in, you are with us. You will never forsake us. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for your strength in us. Strength that through your word transforms us and makes us new. Transform us today, Lord. Make us new. Fill us with your truth. Open our ears so we can hear what the Spirit has to say. Open our eyes so we can see and change our hearts today. We pray this in your holy name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Journey. Good to see you. Remember to dismiss the kids this time, okay? So kids, I think all the way up through uh, middle school, you guys are all dismissed. How many of you are glad it's summer? All right. At least the kids are, huh? <laughs> well, we're glad you're here, and we're glad that we can gather together, especially as we kind of conclude this series this morning. This week was a pretty big week for a lot of people, and even for the nation and for our world, especially as uh, they celebrated the D-Day invasion 75 years ago. And uh, it's the story of uh, the largest amphibious invasion in history of warfare. In fact, on June 6, 1944, more than 150,000 young soldiers from the United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada stormed the beaches of Normandy, France, in a bold strategy to push the Nazis out of Western Europe and turn the tide of the war for good. And of course, it did. But now here's the thing, or a thing, because there's so many stories there. Does anybody know the name Andrew Jackson Higgins? The name Andrew Jackson Higgins. Uh, that's a picture of him. But Adolf Hitler actually described him as the second Noah. And uh, Dwight Eisenhower, General Dwight Eisenhower, said he was the man who won the war for us. But does anybody know why? You know why? That's exactly right. He was the inventor, if you want to call it that, and actually the manufacturer of the boat called the LCVP, the Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel, or affectionately called, guess what, the Higgins Boat. But it was not for a military. It wasn't invented or created initially as a military boat. But originally it was designed to use in the shallow bios of Louisiana, the boat was almost indestructible and able to maneuver in only about 18 inches of water, but equipped with a deep V hull and a bow ramp, the Higgins boat was the perfect craft to land what ended up being thousands of soldiers on the beaches of Normandy on that fateful day in 1944. And so had it not been, at least according to General Dwight Eisenhower and even according to Hitler uh, calling him the new Noah, it, it, perhaps the events or the results or perhaps the, the invasion itself wouldn't have even happened. So it was the secret weapon, if you want to call it, of the success of the D-Day invasion. And as we think about putting on the armor of God in order to do battle against an enemy that is more devious than the, than the Nazis, and uh, it, there is a secret weapon that we want to talk about today. We've already talked about several weapons that are important, several weapons of spiritual warfare, spiritual armor, the belt of truth that we said that helps us overcome uh, falsehood, the breastplate of righteousness that helps us overcome evil, the gospel of peace that helps us overcome anxiety, the shield of faith that helps us overcome fear, and the helmet of salvation 
that helps us overcome confusion. And then last week, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, that helps us overcome temptation. But now, as I said, there is this next one that is a secret weapon and and essence, or maybe the most important weapon that it allows us to be able to do battle against the Satan, against the schemes of Satan. So we're going to read one more time our text in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through, uh, or verses 10 through 17, and look at these first six weapons, and then verses 18 through 20, and look at the secret weapon. So in reverence to the Word of God, let's stand and and do just that. Let's start at verse 10. What's the word? All right, here we go. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, those are the first six, but what is this Higgins boat that allows us to actually succeed against, succeed the most against the schemes of the devil? It's in verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So what is it? What is this seventh, if you can say that, uh, weapon that allows us to succeed like the Higgins boat allowed the D-Day invasion to succeed in our battle against Satan? What is it? It's prayer, isn't it? It's the other side of the coin of the Word of God. So we don't, we don't, it's such, such an amazing thing. But just put this in your mind for another day, okay? There's so many connections between the Word of God and prayer. They're one and the same in the sense of they're both sides. They're different sides of the same coin, and they're important to have them both. And so last week we looked at the Word of God. This week we'll look at prayer, so let's pray. Father God, thank you for who you are for our opportunity to come to you and to know that you have your ears attuned and, and, and listening to, to our voice and waiting for our voice. Lord, you hear the prayers of the righteous. And so I thank you for the righteousness that you've given us in Christ and for the promise that you hear our prayers through him. And so, Lord, we come to you asking you to speak to us today and giving us ears not just to hear but to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You can be seated. The Apostle Paul in this passage, understanding that this is the secret to our success in spiritual battle, gives us what I think are about six power principles for prayer. Are you ready? Let's, let's grab your notes. If you don't have them, uh, feel free to grab them on the, ta- on the table. Write these down. Six power principles for overcoming prayer. The overcomer's prayer, first of all, according to these verses, are all-inclusive. They're all inclusive. Look at them together. He or she prays at all times. It says, praying at all times. In his letter to the Thessalonians, Paul says almost the very same thing, doesn't he? He says, pray without ceasing. Or, or he says to, uh, 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 I think the NIV says, pray continually. But now what, what's that mean? Here's, here's what I think it means. Be in prayer like you're on your phone. Have you ever seen that? Everywhere people go, they have their, they're attached to their phone. They're walking across the street. They're, they're talking with their, somebody at the table. You're laying in bed, whatever it is. Be in communication with God like you are on your phone. What would that be like? Could you imagine that? 
Well, here's the thing. I think it would mean that several things. Number one, it means we would be talking to him at all times, no matter where we are. In fact, the New Testament records prayers being made all the time. Before daylight, Mark 135. I'm not going to have you read all these verses. We're not going to put all these verses up there, but you can look at it. Put up there, first of all, all times, all right? And so, for instance, before daylight, it says, And after rising, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he, Jesus, departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. It means praying on the Sabbath or every day or in this situation on Sunday. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we were supposed to be. There was a place of prayer, and we sat down. That's Paul talking in Acts chapter 16. And when alone, Jesus says, Now it happened that when he was praying alone, Jesus... The disciples were with him, and he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? Luke 9. So pray on, before daylight, early in the morning. Pray on Sabbath. Pray when you're alone. Pray when you're with other people. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it's one of the things that the early church was devoted to. And then pray all night, Luke, if you have to. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. Pray night and day, 1 Timothy 5, 5. And of course, Acts 6, 4, pray continually. So first of all, pray all times, like you're on your phone. And here's the second one, pray for all occasions or on all occasions. If you have your new Bibles, okay, we gave you Bibles last week, or if you have your, your, uh, your phone, since you're on it anyhow, uh, you look up this verse for me. It's James chapter 5, and I think you know most of it, uh, Hebrews James, all right? James chapter 5, Talking about when we're supposed to pray, he says, pray when you're sick, 5 verse 14. It says, let him call, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So pray when we're sick, pray when we sin. Same chapter, different verse, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So pray when you're sick, pray when we've sinned, pray when we're thankful. 2 Corinthians says that. Pray when we're tempted, Matthew 26, 41. And pray when we're in danger or when we're afraid, Acts chapter 27. Paul's on the ship and they're in the middle of a storm. So pray at all times, pray at all occasions, and pray in all places. Pray in all places. In solitary places, Mark 1, 35. On the mountain, Matthew 14, 23. In the temple, Luke 2, 37. On the housetop, Acts 10, 9. In a house, Acts 10, 30. In the church, Acts 12, 5. At the riverside, where we just read in Acts 16, 13. On a ship, Acts 27, 20. I would have to pray on a ship. I have to pray every time I go fishing because I get sick. So I'm praying and feeding the fish, but that's another subject. And in prison, Acts 16, 25. So all times, say that with me, all what? All times, all occasions, all places, and one more for all things. For safety, Matthew, 16, Matthew 24, 20. For forgiveness, Mark eleven twenty five. 25. For food, Acts eleven three 3, and Luke 9, 16. Remember when Jesus get, came and they gave him the bread and the fish, and he lifts up his hands, he lifts up the bread and the fish, and he thanks God for the food. I think about that. I think, you know, we do that. That might be the one thing that we do. We probably all agree on. We probably all pray before we, before we eat, but we have, a, we have Jesus' example for that. So pray for our food. Pray for faith, Luke twenty two thirty two. 32. If any of, and pray for all people, John 17, 9. Pray for healing, for spiritual wisdom, for relief from suffering. James 5, 18, where it says that Elijah prayed for rain. And, uh, and then pray for children, Luke 1, 13. Zachariah and Elizabeth, pray for health and prosperity and pray for spiritual strength. So here's the thing. I don't care where you are or what you're dealing with. There's one thing to do. Can you guess what it is? pray. You're sitting at a stoplight. You're waiting on a train. You're in a doctor's office. Wherever it might be, all times, all occasions, all places, all things. Think about that the next time you're attached to your phone, because I think this idea of praying at all times means we are in constant contact with the Father. Constant contact with the Father. Setting to the stoplight, setting at school, seeing the doctor or dentist or doing the laundry or mowing the lawn is always a good time 
to pray. In fact, if you're worrying about things, something or you're thinking about something, let it be a, a, a warning or a catalyst for you to pray. Paul says in, in Philippians uh, 4, 6, Do not be anxious about everything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. So there are several power principles for overcoming prayer, for what we're calling overcoming prayer. And the first one is to, prayer is all-inclusive. So pray at all times for all things and in all occasions. Second, the overcomer's prayer is, in just walking through this verse together, we see that the overcomer's prayer is what? Not only all-inclusive or at all times, but it is in the Spirit. It's in the Spirit. So the idea here is notice that Jesus, on the night before he was betrayed, told his disciples that he was going away, right? But he said, don't be afraid. Not only am I going to prepare a place for you, but I'm going to send somebody to comfort you, to teach you, to instruct you, and even to help you pray. And I'm going to send a comforter, someone who will actually be with you at all times, not like I, am, I, not like I, unlike I can be, because right then he was in the human form, so he wasn't. So I'm going to send this comforter, this Holy Spirit, with you, to you, that's going to help you actually even not just comfort you, but teach you what to pray and even how to pray. Amazing verse. Look at Romans 8, 26 and 27. He says, likewise, the Spirit helps you in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You know, maybe sometimes the first thing we should pray is, Lord, I don't know what to pray. Teach me what to pray. Let me know what you want to pray. And so it needs to be overcoming power or overcoming prayer is Spirit-led. It's not only all-inclusive, it's Spirit-led. It's similar to... And so we realize that we need to even search our hearts and let the Holy Spirit search our hearts to know not only what to pray, but what is in our hearts. The psalmist said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So overcomer's prayer is all-inclusive. It's in the spirit. And third, it's balanced with all prayer and supplication. Now, I don't know about you, but this week, just looking at that, something seemed to click with me that I'm not sure I had clicked quite before. As I understood this, or as I looked at it, as to what are the elements of prayer? And you can look at it, first of all, with all prayer. But I think this word, actually all prayer, again, we talked about it before, is, it's, is actually that is what is the God word part of our prayers. There are two parts to prayer. There is a God word part, and then I'm going to say there is the downward part, or there's the man part. The God word part is that which is with all prayer. It's the same words that all, earlier uh, Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. He said, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by those same two words, by prayer and supplication. And this time he says, and with thanksgiving. So both offer prayer with thanksgiving and both offer supplication with thanksgiving. And those two parts, again, as I said, are one that's God word, the prayer, and one that is man word, which is the supplications. And so now what he's saying is that our prayer needs to have these two parts. Part of it needs to be focused on God, and part of it needs to be focused on our needs. And that's the exact example that Jesus gave us when he told his disciples, when his disciples said, Lord, teach me to pray. He said, I'll teach you how to pray. First, have a Godward part, and second, have a manward part. And the Godward part, he says, when he says, our, pray like this, our Father in heaven, that's the upward part, that's the prayer. In heaven, hallowed be your name, our kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then there are the supplications, the second part, which is manward. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So when you and I go to pray and we want to have overcomer pa pa prayer, we want to be sure that there is a Godward element to that in which we acknowledge God and who he is. And then secondly, where we're honest to God with our needs as well, the manward part and the needs of those that we care about and that we're concerned about too. And the issue is this, is sometimes people think that, man, if I just pray, that that's not what prayer is, that if I pray about my needs, then that's kind of immature prayer, that's kind of self-centered prayer. But Jesus gives us permission to do both of those things when he teaches the disciples how to pray 
like this. And when again, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6 that we should have prayer that is not only all-inclusive, that is not only spirit-led, but is also balanced with prayer, Godward, and also with supplication, being honest to God with our needs. In fact, it's what Jesus said in Matthew and Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, when the writer of Hebrews says, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up what? Prayers and supplications, manward and also focused on man, a uh, God word, but also focus on man when he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me, but if, if thy will be done, then, then your will be done. And notice he did it with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from the death and he was heard because of his reverence. So we don't need to think that we can't pray for our needs. We don't need to think that we can't pray for the needs of others, but we also need to know, however, that we need to acknowledge who it is we're praying to and his greatness, and his goodness. So we pray balanced prayers with prayer and supplication. Fourth, the prayer that overcomes everything is watchful. Verse 4, again, verse 18, chapter 6, verse eight, uh, 18, he says, to that end, keep alert, keep alert, or watchful. The word here just means being watchful, like the military imagery of the armor. Paul translates the same kind of military imagery when he tells them to keep awake, to be watchful, to be on guard at, at all times. And it's no coincidence that when we go to pray, we what? Fall asleep. You know, I don't know whether it's because we choose to do it at night or choose to do it in the morning or whatever it is, or whether because we really are in spiritual battle and we're in conflict. And so Satan comes along and gets us to kind of uh, not be watchful, to fall asleep. Jesus, on the very night that he needed his disciples to pray for him the most, took them into the Garden of, of Gethsemane, and they did what? They fell asleep, didn't they? And how many times did they fall asleep? Once? Twice? Three times, wasn't it? Three times. The first time, Jesus comes back, and he says, guys, can you stay awake for an hour? Don't you know? In fact, he goes on, and see, what's the verse? He says, and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. What I loved about that is I thought, again, here's the two things, the connectivity between the word of God and between prayer. Both of those are tools against the same devil to be able to resist temptation. Both the word of God, which Jesus used as an example, and also here to pray, which Jesus reminds his disciples that they need to do so that they would not enter into temptation. <laughs> I can remember uh, I, I, would, I was visiting, uh, there would be a number of, of elderly folks, members of the church I used to visit uh, in, in, uh, a few years ago, and one particular person lived in one of the high-rises downtown, uh, what we kind of used to call projects, but, um, but I remember that the high-rise was always set on the same temperature, so I don't, I don't know how it is in here, it actually feels a little warm, but that's probably just me. Um, but I remember it was very warm in this high rise. And I can remember that it, I'd usually go in the afternoon and I want you to know that I would always fall asleep or be tempted to fall asleep. But I'm visiting this person, so I gotta stay awake. So I would take, uh, if you wanna do this right now, you can do it if you're, especially if you're tempted to fall asleep. If you just take your fingernail and push it into your cuticle, you know, just below your fingernail, it's amazing how much that hurts <laughs> and actually how that would kind of keep you awake you know, and, and keep you from becoming distracted. So next time you fall asleep and, and when you're praying, just, you know, push your cuticle. Anybody trying that, actually? No? Nobody's? Okay, good, good. I figured you would. That, that, that's great. But I'm told that actually early cowboys guarding a herd at night sometimes took drastic measures to keep alert. And that's what this verse is saying. Actually, be alert in your prayer. And so don't let yourself get distracted, whether it's by sleep or anything else. But here's what they would do to keep themselves awake. They rub tobacco juice in their eyes. So, again, another choice for you, you know, to be able to use uh, to keep awake in your, in, your, in your prayers. But here's the thing. They did it to keep watch over their sheep. How much more we should do it to be in fellowship with the Lord and to care for his sheep and to pray for his sheep. But now the Apostle Paul gives us what I think here is a fifth 
power principle for overcoming everything, for prayer that overcomes everything, and that is fifth, the prayer that overcomes everything is persistent. Notice he says, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance. Jesus tells a story. In fact, he tells several stories. That's really what parables are. So the reality is this is probably a true story or based on a true story or based on a true incident or actual incidents. And it's in Luke chapter 11. It's a, it's a story of perseverance. And, and, and you know the story, I think. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my kids are in bed. <laughs> kind of like actually, what would you say, right? If you went over to your neighbors and they have kids, probably the same thing. My door is now shut and my children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you though, he will not get up and give him anything because he's his friend. Yet, because of his imprudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. That's the ESV, and we'll look at that word imprudence in just a moment. But that was probably a very common experience, and I'll tell you why. In that day, especially in the summer, it got very hot, so travelers would travel at night. They would arrive wherever they're going to stay, the Airbnb, they had it before we did. And, uh, and, and they would get there, and the host was supposed to have some kind of food. Maybe this host was not that good a host. He ha didn't have very good ranking. He didn't check, they didn't check on the, on the, on the app. Uh, to see what he had gotten, doesn't have food, nice place to stay, but they don't have food, all right? So, uh, but apparently he didn't have food, but he knew he needed to get food. So he went to his neighbor, went, got the food, went to try to go get the food. The neighbor says, no, I'm, my kids are in bed. Uh, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to help you. But so the neighbor actually does what? Goes away. No, he pounds on the door some more. I don't know, maybe he kicks on the door, whatever it took for him to get it. And the neighbor, not because, of, not because he's a friend, but because of, of his imprudence. And that word here, the NIV, in New Living Translation, actually says shameless persistence. And notice it's because of his shameless persistence, the friend knew that he wasn't going to stop, and that the only way to stop him was to actually give him what he wanted. So he rose and he gave him whatever he needs. Now, here's what Philip Yancey says to that in his book, Prayer. He said, if such a neighbor eventually rouses to give you what you want to get rid of you, imagine how much more God will respond to your bold persistence in prayer because he loves you. I added that. We then should pray like a salesman with his foot wedged in the door opening like a wrestler and who has an opponent in his, in his headlock. Yancey concluded by saying, raise your voice, strive on, like the shameless neighbor in the middle of the night, keep pounding on the door. Now, I don't know for you, but I will say this. What that raises for me, the question that raises for me is, why do we have to pray with perseverance, with persistence? Is God some hard of hearing God? Is he some God who needs to be nagged, some old man or old woman that just needs to be nagged to give them what you want? Or does God have a purpose and a plan for our persistence? I want to suggest to you that he does, and there's probably numerous reasons, but I've only got several. One is God wants us to persist in prayer to maintain and deepen our connection with him, to maintain and to deepen our connection with him. That's why he wants us to persevere. Every Saturday, I've told you this before, Carol and I go out to breakfast. It's one thing that we do. We do a lot of other things spontaneously, and sometimes we don't get around to very many other things, but for the most part, we guard that time. And so Saturday morning, we'll be somewhere out for breakfast. We need that time. We run all week. We run all weekend. So right somewhere in the middle of that, we connect with each other. We persist with that. It's not something we let just organically happen, but we persist in that to maintain and deepen our connection with one another, and we need to do that with God as well. Second, God wants us to persist in prayer to purify our desires. Let's admit it. The, the, could you imagine if we prayed for anything or if you just thought about something and God gave it to you? I think it was, a 19, I think it was 1971. I had a 19... It was 1971. I had a 1966 Pontiac Grand Prix. Anybody remember those? Okay, a 1966 Pontiac Grand Prix. Anybody not born in 66, okay? Now, that's good. That's good. I'm glad you're here. Uh, uh, you, but there are children's classes <laughs> over there for you. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, uh, don't take that the way it even sounds. It was just a joke. 
but here's the thing. I remember that it was 1971 or 1971 that, that I got that car, and I remember the 1971 Pontiac. I think it had a, it had kind of a, uh, a real big nose on it and just the, the pointed nose on it, whatever, and I prayed that God would give me that car. I wanted a 19, and then I can remember. I bet it wasn't three. I, I'll say it was five years later, maybe even 10 years later. I, I'll say it was 10 years later. I remember driving down the road and seeing a 1971 Pontiac Grand Prix, just like the one I wanted, and I thought, man, I'm glad God didn't give me that. I mean, because who wants that? First of all, it was 10 years old. But, you know, on the other hand, it wasn't, the style wasn't vogue. It wasn't cool. You know, and there was new styles. God doesn't give us everything we want. And we can be glad that he doesn't give us everything we want. If he did, I think we'd treat him like a genie, wouldn't we? We'd treat him like our good luck pocket or like a genie. We wouldn't treat him like the God that he is and the Savior that he is and the friend that he is as well. And so what it is, is God wants us to persist in our prayers, not so that he'll needs to be nagged, but so that our, our prayers might be refined, our desires might be purified, so we will pray for what God wants us to have, so that we will actually be conformed to his mind and to his heart and attuned to his perspective. Then our prayers, the psalmist says, will be answered. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. E. Stanley Jones puts it this way, prayer is surrender. I don't have this quote for you, so listen. Surrender to the will of God in cooperation with that will. If I throw out a boat hook from the boat and catch hold of the shore and pull it, what happens? What happens, Mark? Does the, does the, does the shore come to me or do I go to the shore? Yeah, I go to the shore, don't I? And what we're trying to do sometimes in our prayers, we're trying to pull God towards us, when in reality, the reason we need to persist, because God is trying to pull us towards him. So we would desire what he desires for us. So why do we have to persist in prayer? One, to maintain and deepen our connection with him. And two, to purify our desires. And third, God wants us to persist in prayer so we would know that he is the one who we're dependent upon. He's the one who answers prayer, and he's the one who is the giver of every good and every perfect gift. I think I told you this story. Maybe some of you I haven't. It's probably several years ago. It is several years ago now. My oldest son was actually probably in fifth or sixth grade. He was going to take music at the school he was going to, and guess what instrument he wanted to play? Not the trumpet, because we have a trumpet. Not the clarinet, because we have the clarinet, but he wanted to play the saxophone, and not just any saxophone. He wanted to play the baritone saxophone. Is that right? Just a saxophone? Tenor saxophone. That's good. Okay, a tenor saxophone. Um, so where was I going with that? <laughs> we knew we didn't have money to rent it. We knew we didn't have money to buy it. But we also somehow had a conversation with another teacher who said, I've got one. She had one in the attic that she wasn't using. So I remember we took a week, and this is what I told her. I said, well, give us a week. I said, we're going to pray about it. And every night we prayed about it at dinner. And then we arranged on one particular night that time, right at dinner time, like at, when we knew we were going to be praying, we arranged for her to come down the street because she was down the street. Some of you might know her, Kathy Lee. So we arranged for her to come down the street right at the time we knew we were going to pray and told her to ring the doorbell and then leave the tenor saxophone at the door and run. She left the tenor sax. She rang the doorbell, left the tenor sax at the, phone, at the, at the door, and then ran. And when the doorbell rang, I told Ben that my oldest son, who had been praying about this saxophone, I said, I don't know. Who is that? I don't know. I said, go see who it is. He goes to see who it is, and guess what he sees? <laughs> he sees that God answers prayer. That's what he sees. He sees a God who loves him. He, see a God, he sees a God who answers prayer because we prayed about it. He sees a God who, who we're dependent upon, yes, because we didn't have the money for it, but God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Why do we persist in prayer? Because it maintains and deepens our connection with him. It purifies our desires, and it reminds us that we need him and that he loves us. And that he's the one who answers prayer, and he's the giver of every good and perfect gift. So that's why I love the rest of this parable. Jesus closes the teaching of his disciples with this parable, of this parable, in Luke chapter 11, verses 11 and 13. He says, what father among you, if a son asks for a fish, will give him instead of fish, gives him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. 
If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Sometimes we forget just how good God is, especially when we don't get what we want or when we want it. But we have to remember that he's in the process of deepening our connection with him, of purifying our desires and reminding him, us, that we need him and he, that he answers prayer and that he is a giver of every good and every perfect gift. Those are the power principles. First, the prayer that overcomes everything is inclusive, all-inclusive. We pray at all times, for all occasions, at all places, and all things. Second, it's spirit-led. Third, it's balanced with upward prayers and downward prayers. And fourth, it is watchful. And fifth, it is persistent. And sixth, it's focused on others. Did you see it? We're just working our way through this passage to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance. And what? making supplication for all the saints. It's others-focused. Not just on ourselves, that's okay, but it's also others-focused. And, and so Paul says, we pray for all the saints. Jesus set that example when he prayed for his disciples in John 17, 9. He said, I'm praying for them. I'm praying for the world, not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And then Paul prayed regularly for those in the church he visited too. In Romans chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, he prays for them. He says that, that without ceasing, I mention you, talking to the, about the Romans, for God's my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I mention you in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will, I may at last succeed in coming to you. But now besides exhorting them to pray for others, in particular, all saints, Paul specifies, gets specific, and he says there's one person among all the saints I want you to pray for, church, at Ephesus. Who is that? Look at verse 19. He says, and also for me, praying at all times in the Spirit, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me. Paul wasn't too big of a man, too confident of a person, too full of himself to not ask the church to pray not only for one another, but to ask them to pray for him. And what's amazing is he does that in nearly all of his other letters, the church at Colossae, the church at, obviously here at Ephesus, the church at Philippi, the church at Thessalonica, over and over, the church at Corinth. Paul asked the church to pray for him. But notice here in these verses, what does he specifically ask the church at Ephesus to pray for him? Two things. He asked them to, give, he asked them to pray that God would give him the words to say as he shares the mystery of the gospel. That God would fill his mind and fill his mouth with the words that they need to say. And secondly, he prays that they would he ask them to pray that he would be able to speak those words boldly. When a visitor asked Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, the secret of his fruitful ministry, he thought for a moment and then he replied, my people pray for me. I've probably been at four different churches in my ministry. And every one of the churches, either during, before, or after, there was a moral failure. My question almost every time was, did you pray for your pastor? You're not the only one in a spiritual battle. Anyone who handles the word of God, your Sunday school teachers, your leadership team, your staff, is in a spiritual battle too. I'm not too proud or don't want to be too proud to, like Paul, say pray for me also. Pray for us also. If the Spirit moves because prayer is Spirit-led, at the end of the service, I'm going to ask you to pray. We can't talk about prayer and not pray. So we're asking probably to get in groups of two or three and pray together, pray for the saints, pray for those who handle the word of God as well, and pray for me. 
That's what Paul says is the overcomer's prayer. It's a prayer that is prayed that's focused on others. Paul gives us then six power principles for prayer that overcomes everything. Prayer that overcomes everything is all-inclusive. At all times, all occasions, all places, and all things. It's spirit-led. It's balanced. It's both upward and manward. It's watchful. It's persistent. And it's focused on others. But now, before we practice that prayer, let me just suggest this to you. Just like we've talked about how do we put on these other pieces of armor, let me suggest to you ways we can put on this powerful prayer, this overcomer's prayer. One is to plan to pray. No one ever just organically prays, unless they're in a crisis, right? They don't just, pl- they don't just fall into prayer. No one drifts into disciplined prayer. Daniel, Jesus, Paul, and the believers in the early church all set aside specific times for prayer. Daniel 6.10 When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day as a day and prayed and gave thanks to before his Lord. And this is the best part, as he had done previously. So it was he planned to pray and he didn't let anything stop his him from praying. So build into your schedule a consistent and specific time to do nothing but pray. Second is find practical ways to, to, to be alert, to stay awake, to minimize drift. Jesus told us in Matthew 6, 6, he said, to enter our closet and pray to our Father in secret. Matthew 6, 6. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. He was referring to the storage rooms in an Israeli homes in the first century. In those days, Houses were filled with children and, uh, 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 and, and animals, and there was little privacy, but most of the houses had rooms for storing supplies. So it would have been a small room, cluttered and unheated, but it was that closet that he was talking about, not your and my walk-in closets, okay? <laughs> talking more like a fruit cellar or some kind of cold storage. So it wouldn't have been terribly comfortable, but it would have been private for at least a moment away from the children and perhaps away from the animals as well. And if you don't have a closet or a room where you can go to minimize mental draft, then you can do what maybe you've heard Susanna Wesley did. She had 13 children, and so to find a moment of privacy, what she did is she took her apron and threw it up over her head. And when any of those 13 children saw mom with the apron over her head, they knew she was in her prayer closet, and they better not bother her. So how do we do it? How do we apply it? How do we put it on? We plan to pray. We find practical ways to minimize our drift. And number three, we pray with others. Meet regularly with a small group of committed prayer warriors. And if you're married, pray regularly with your partner. Also at church, the early church was devoted to praying together, Acts 2.42. And then another one is develop a system for your prayer list. Sometimes, uh, certainly the Spirit needs to guide us in our praying as we talk, but it's also good to have a list of prayer needs that burden us most. People who need to be saved, problems that need to be solved, provision for, for our work and for the work of the Lord around the world. And there are plenty of ways to do it. You can do it on your phone. You can do it in a notebook or a prayer journal. One of the ways that I've done it lately actually is actually just on index cards. And so I stick them in here and I've got a stack of them. These go back to March 17th, March, the week of March 17th, March 24th, March 31st, April 7th, and all the way up to last week, 6-2. It's not the only ones I have, but those are the ones that are weekly that I try to keep and stick in my notebook and take on a walk or wherever I might, or wherever I might be and wherever I might be praying. So make a list, develop a system for your prayers. Whatever works for you, just do it. And finally, like wait on a word when we talked last week when we're reading the sword of the Lord, pray until you pray. That's what the Puritans used to do. They would seek to pray long enough and authentically enough to move past the formalism and the religion and the ritual to delighting in God's presence. So of all the pieces of spiritual armor that we've been talking about in this series, the belt of truth, to overcome falsehood, the breastplate of righteousness, 
to overcome evil, the gospel of peace, overcome anxiety, the shield of faith, overcome fear, the helmet of salvation, to overcome confusion and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, to overcome temptation, the most powerful of all, the Higgins boat of the D-Day invasion that won the war, the tool, the weapon that will win our war, that will help us to overcome everything, is prayer. So let me ask you as we close, which one of these prayer habits do you have and which ones do you need by the grace of God to grow in this summer? To make your prayers those that are in all places, at all times, at all things, and on all occasions. I'm amazed at the things that sometimes people forget to pray for. I didn't think of praying for that. There's nothing you can't pray about. If you can think about it, pray about it. Or being spirit-led. God, I don't even know what to pray. I don't even know how to pray. I don't even want to pray. And ask the Spirit to place a desire in your heart to pray and then to know what to pray. Or to be balanced and praying with prayer and with supplication upward and downward. And then being watchful, minimizing distractions, or being persistent, not giving up, knowing that God has a purpose and not answering our prayer. Maybe it's to purify our desires. Maybe it's for us to learn. I wonder if the worship team would come. I'm not sure how or whether to do it that way. And just play something. Because like I said, there's no way we can pray, no way we can talk about prayer and not pray. And then what's one or two strategies we talked about that you can adopt to grow in your prayer life so you can live the life of the overcomer that Christ has provided a way for us to live? Maybe it's just a plan to pray, find a time, set a time, try a time. And let me suggest, just like sometimes too, I think we think, well, man, I got to pray every day. How's that work with exercise? Let me just ask you, does that work good? When you start a new exercise program, how's every day work for you? It doesn't work, does it? How about two days? How about three days? So plan to pray. Find a practical way to minimize mental drift. Don't do it at the middle of the night or when you're really tired. I keep another list of cards. I got another stack of index cards. These are my weekly cards. This is stuff I need, people I need to see, things I need to do. So when I'm praying, usually I'm distracted by what it is I need, what something else I need to do, right? So I keep this one right next to my prayer card, and then when Satan comes along, distracts me with something I need to do, I write that down, and then I put that away because I won't. I, I got it now written down. Maybe you're more disciplined. You don't need all these helps. Maybe it's pray with others. Maybe it's develop a system. Or maybe it's pray until you pray. Until it's not just a routine or it's not just a ritual, but it's real. Chances are some of you are studying next to a spouse or a family member. It's probably going to be the most awkward part of the service this morning. So I want you to stand with me. Right? In a minute, I'm going to ask you to find a partner, two or three. That's what it says. When two or three are gathered together, the Lord's there. So I think I'm going to take that as kind of a command. And here's, here's what I want to do. I want you to find a prayer partner, and I want you to pray upward and downward. I want you to pray a prayer of acknowledging that God is God and he is good, or however He, the Spirit leads you. And then I also want you to pray for others, for your needs, for all the saints, Carl Roush had hip surgery this week on Friday. Surgery went well. But his biggest fear is that uh, how do I take care of Terry? Because he cooks, he carries a lot of that load in caring for her that she can't do. Pray for them. And uh, If you want to help, uh, you can see Gwen or you can see Carol perhaps or Katie. She's not here this morning. But I want you to pray for them. I want you to pray for Barry and Joni. I think I saw them here. I didn't get to talk to them. They're back. They had a 
bike accident last week, and not last week, week before that in uh, Canada. And uh, praise God, uh, Jody's not hurt more than she is, and Barry's not, he's doing well as, as well. But I heard the helmet crack. So imagine if she hadn't had a helmet. Pray for them. Talked to Les and Harriet this week. Harriet wanted to live <laughs> till her granddaughter graduated. She graduated. She got to go to her, her, her graduation. Took her in a wheelchair, obviously, but uh, it's every day. But he's encouraged and he's grateful and he knows that their being there has extended her life. Pray for them. No doubt there are other prayer requests that people have here too. And then will you do me another favor? Pray for me. Yesterday, I came home and there were three police cars across the street. My neighbors. Two weeks ago, I went over and talked to my neighbor. He shared with me some things he's been wrestling with, some, some real spiritual battles. I stopped in the driveway and prayed with him, and uh, he lost that battle yesterday. Uh, the war's not over, amen? But he lost that battle yesterday, came home drunk, hit a, flame, hit a light post. All of our neighbors gathered last night, at least right around that neighbor right around that neighbor on the corner. I think one of them is a believer. I know the others aren't. But you know what God did? He opened up the door of opportunity to pray with all my neighbors. <laughs> I told Carol, I said, I don't even know where those words came from. I think they were spirit-led. God, I don't know what to pray. Help my prayer. Our... our our worship team is going to continue to pray or play and pray. But will you turn to someone right now, a group of two or three, pray with them. Somebody in that group pray. Not all of you need to pray. Let the Spirit lead. Get somehow in a group. Pray for those things. Pray for all the saints. Pray for me. Pray for those people that we mentioned. You can sit. You can stand. You can do whatever you want. We're going to, we're going to take a few minutes to do this. You don't have to go far. If y'all want to pray out loud, it'll make me feel at home. That's the way I grew up.
For every fear, there's an empty grave. For the reason one has overcome. Now the dark. Fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to a hope beyond. Oh, creation waits with an expectation to declare the reign of the Lord our God. We will not be moved when the earth gives way. For the reason one has overcome. And for every fear, there's an empty grave. For the reason one has overcome. Sing us again. We will not be moved. We will not be moved when the earth gives way. For the reason one has overcome. And for every fear. And for every fear, there's an empty grave. For the reason one has overcome. If we could have the ushers come forward, take the offering this morning. As always, on the notes, there's a response card. If um, there's anything that, uh, that we could be praying about, We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to uh, just join in with you and uh, help carry each other's burdens, as the Bible says. So please use those response cards. One of the things that uh, that I do in, in, in praying is uh, just taking a walk um, in some nature trail or in a park. And it's, it's, it's funny because the last uh, takeaway that Denny gave us was pray until you pray. Well, there's a lot of times that I'll start uh, walking and, and I, I literally don't know what to pray. Like, I almost have a sense like everything's fine. You know, like I don't really need anything, God, but I'm going to start praying because I want to kind of feel your presence, you know. So I just start talking to him. Not asking for anything, but just talking to him. And about 30, 45 minutes later when I'm done, the list of things that I have to pray for is unending. It just keeps coming. It's like God just opens my eyes to how much He, we need him, I need him. And so that's one of the things I love when I when I have the time to do that, is that he reveals to me um, the things that I need to turn him to, you know, to turn toward him for, and uh, which is which is everything. And so, uh, pray until you pray. I love that one. And so I thank you for that. I wanted to share one last thing, a quote from Martin Luther. It says, "To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing." 
that's the breath that's the breath of our uh, relationship with Christ. So let's pray together. Father God, we just thank you uh, for the message that you've given and worked through Denny this week and and probably even longer than that. Just thank you for preparing our hearts to hear this message. And I just feel your spirit moving this morning, knowing that you're alive and that you're here and that you're constantly working in our lives and in our hearts. Father, we feel that this morning. We thank you so much for, for everyone that, that is here and how uh, you have brought us together to, to worship you, to make much of you, but also to love one another and to encourage one another. And so I pray, Lord, that we'll just take another step closer um, in our in our uh, prayer life and our reliance on you that uh, that we'll be more intentional in, in speaking with you. And that's really what it is. Our prayer is just is just spending time talking to you and acknowledging you. And we need that each and every day. And so I pray you'll do that. I pray you'll just awaken us this morning. Just thank you again for everyone that is here. Uh, the ones that aren't, I pray you'll be with them to, for physical healing, but also for uh, just spiritual strength and encouragement. Um, so we love you. We thank you for all that you do. And we want to pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Like, that Band-Aid ain't coming off without hair stuck. Like, my kid got their head stuck in the railing again stuck. Like, I just paid a buck fifty for nothing stuck. All of us have been stuck at one time or another. Whether stuck in a relationship, a career, debt, there are many ways that we can find ourselves stuck. Join us as we move from being stuck to unstuck. Starts next Sunday on Father's Day. It is called Unstuck. We're going to be looking at some of the Old Testament heroes, uh, David and Moses and Abraham and Joseph and uh, and actually Jonathan and David. And so see how uh, they got moving from being stuck to unstuck. And so that starts next Sunday on Father's Day. So don't forget two things about Father's Day. Also, one is the Flapjack Sunday. So come a little early. We're start at 930 serving pancakes. And also, if you picked up a, 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 a milk bottle that you're supposed to fill up, not with milk, please, but with money and bring back for uh, a pregnancy decision center. That's our goal to bring that back next week. So if yours isn't quite full, you can keep it. But if it is full, then go ahead and bring it as a part of that on on uh, on on uh, Father's Day. And then one other thing, talking about prayer, our women are going to be doing a summer block actually called The War Room, and it's on prayer. And so they saw the movie last week, and then they're going to begin the Bible study uh, on Tuesdays. So you're invited to our house, and we'll be uh, the ladies will be doing that Bible study for the next four Tuesdays as well. So I, I think that might be it. Is that it? All right, let's go. See you later. Have a great week. Put up the chairs. Keep praying. Keep praying.